Hello everyone, here is our illusion. Welcome back to WebGPU Fundamental Tutorials. In the last tutorial, we learned lighting and also practice in WebGPU how to implement the phone lighting model. And today we're going to learn shadows. Shadows will make the light effect more realistic. So what is shadow? It is somewhere the light can't reach. It is easier to express the spatial relationship between objects. For example, the red example with a shadow. Apart from the spatial relationship, the 3D structures of the sphere and cubes is more clear. So how do we calculate and simulate the shadow effects? It's a shame that the shadows are not easy to achieve, at least for real-time rendering. We can only make some approximation to deal with the shading techniques. And today we're going to introduce a good performance and simple one, shadow mapping. First of all, let's introduce the basic idea of shadow mapping. The light starts from the lighting source. And where it can reach will be lit, and where it cannot reach will turn into dark. For example, this light ray will not reach the floor section after the box, so this is the shadows. Let's abstract this procedure, just a ray of light from the light source. It will hit elements in the scene in turn. P1 of the box, P2, and P3. And P1 is the closest points to the light source. It will be lit. And P2 and P3 are considered to be in the shadows. So the theoretical calculation process of shadows should be emitting a lot of radiations from the light source and then calculate the position of the fragment hit by this ray in turn. Compare the distance between the fragment and the light source. And the nearest point will be lit and the others will be in the dark. But considering there are thousands of fragment elements, it's gonna be very expensive to calculate. So we usually make an approximate approach. So we don't have to manually calculate the intersections of the rays. And here we are going to use GPU drawing mechanism, which is depth buffering. When we talked about the 3D transformation, we briefly introduced the depth testing. We could ask the GPU to compare the depth information of each element before rendering and store the Z value from 0 to 1 in a depth map. In the same position, we only keep the fragment with the smallest Z value. So the objects closest to the scene will be rendered and the others will be discarded. We render the whole scene from the position of the light source, we'll get a depth map. And then we save the depth value in the depth map. And then actually we can get the closest point to the light source. We can make inquiries from the depth map to determine whether an element is the closest intersection. Or in other words, is it in the shadows? So let's give a summarize now. We will render the scene twice. The first time we start from the location of the light source and then render the scene in the direction of the light to get the depth information. The Z value will be written into a depth map. For example, point C. From the light source, the depth is 0 0.4. So finally, the Z value of 0 0.4 will be written into the depth map. And after this, we are going to render it the second time from the real camera view. And we need to compare the depth value of each fragment with the value in the depth map. For example, point P, the depth is 0 0.9. And if we look up the depth map, the Z value for this corresponding fragment is 0 0.4. So the depth of this point is greater than the value in the shader map. So this point will not be the first interaction of the light, which means it is in the shadows. So we don't need to calculate the lighting of this fragment. This is the principal part, and now let's practice in detail in WebGPU. We put our demo code in the GitHub repo. Welcome to download and practice. Now let's take a look into the demo first. It is a very simple scene. There is a parallel lighting rotating around the center to show the changes of the shadows in real time. Let's look into the code. Firstly, in order to render twice, we need to create two render pipelines. 
as well as two corresponding depth map. One is a depth map for rendering lights, and the other one is to rendering the whole scene from the camera view. Firstly, the shadow pipelines. Because we just need to get the depth in results from the vertex, so we don't have to set the configuration from for its fragment shader. And we don't need to output the color and it will save the GPU performance. We introduced before the depth map for a normal render pipeline should match the size of canvas. But depth map for the shadow pipeline, we can set it individually. And this is the resolution of the texture. The larger the texture resolution, the higher the definition of the shadow. And of course, it will require some more video memory space and assume the pipeline performance. And because we need to compare this shadow map in the shader, we need to add a texture bending. Bind into the group and pass into the shader. And here we bind the shadow map into the group one of the render pipeline. So it can be used in the fragment shader later. And next point, just like the ordinary textures, depth map also need a sampler. We don't need to get a specific depth value, but just to compile the value of say. And there is a compiler option built into the WebGPU. For example, we are going to use less here to compile. And in the shader, we can get the depth comparing result. If it is less, then return 0, otherwise return 1. So we don't have to code if-else conditions. We will learn this in detail later in the shader. OK, let's focus on the execution of the pipeline. And like before, we need to create two rendered pipelines. And for the shadow pass, we don't have a fragment shader. So there is no color output. So we don't have to set the color attachment of the shadow pass. We only need to set a corresponding depth map attachment. And that is the first rendering result. We just need to put the depth information of each vertex into the depth map. And in the second rendering, we are going to draw all scenes from the camera view. And use the first depth map to calculate the result of the shadow. And in practice, this kind of multiple rendering pipelines are very common. And each pipeline is only responsible for part of the rendering process. And using textures or buffers to put the result into the next pipeline. And the final scene is rendered by the last pipeline. And another thing we need to pay attention here is the projection matrix of light. As we've said, the first rendering is the perspective of light. So just assume that it's a camera. It is necessary to generate a corresponding projection matrix. We use perspective transformation of camera to simulate a near large and far small effect. So what are we going to do with the lightings? Actually, different types of lighting will use a different projection transformation. If it is a parallel light, the size of the shadow will not change according to the distance. So we usually use the orthogonal projections. But for point light and the spotlight, it has a specific position. So a perspective transformation is usually taken. The shadow processing of a point light source is actually very complicated. We'll introduce later. Here we just uh, demonstrate a simple directional light projection. We can simply call mat 4 auth this API to generate an orthogonal matrix. According to the scene size, we generate a rectangular space to wrap all the objects. If the size is very close to the scene size, then the depth map coverage is also very high. So we can get a better quality of shadows at the same resolution. The objects outside this range will not be displayed and there will be no shadow rendering. Okay, let's look into the specific operations in the shader. Firstly, the vertex shader in the shadow pipeline. It's just a simple projection coordinates transformation. The only difference is the projection matrix here is not a camera, but uh, the matrix of lights. We still use the MVP matrix multiplied with the vertex coordinates. 
And the final output is the projection spatial coordinates of all objects in the light perspective. We don't need to do the fragment shader, but conduct the depth testing directly. And the result of the minimum depth at each fragment will be stored in the depth map. At this time, there is no results on the screen. It's just the eternal cache operation of GPU. Afterwards, GPU will start working on the second render pipeline. It is almost the same as the previous demo. We start from the normal camera view, output the position of the coordinate transformation, and also the frag position, frag normal, and the UV informations. And we also need to know each vertex coordinates in the light projection. So we can compare the depth information in the fragment shader later. And the position in the depth map is actually from the perspective view of light. So we need to use the light projection again to perform a coordinate transformation. And we need to pay attention to the difference between the several positions here. The default output position is the projected coordinates transformed by the camera MVP matrix. It is for GPU to draw all the geometric relationships. And frag position is the word coordinate that does not include the projection transformation, which is used to assist in calculating the direction of the incidence of light. And pulse from light is the projected coordinates transformed by the light MVP matrix, which is used for finding the depth information in light maps. And here is a little trick to note. In the texture UV coordinate system, we always use the range from 0 to 1. But the coordinates of MVP transformation is a space from minus 1 to 1. So for our own convenience, we can convert the coordinates here. So we multiply the x, y in the pulse from light by 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, and then add 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. So we can map the coordinates from minus 1 to 1 to 0 to 1. And now let's look into the rendering operation in the fragment shader. For demonstration purpose, we only calculate a diffuse reflection co coefficient and assume the ambient light coefficient is 0 0.3 and the color of light is set to white. So the final output of each fragment is the color of the object multiplied by the factor of ambient light and plus the diffuse reflection light. To add the effect of shadows, we can give a diffuse reflection coefficient multiplied by the coefficient of a shadow. If the shadow coefficient is zero, then the final light will ignore the effects of diffuse light. And we only consider the basic ambient light. So it is not illuminated by the parallel light, which means it is in shadow. On the contrast, if the shadow factor is 1, then it means it's not in the shadow. So the key part is to calculate the coefficient of shadow. And we have a special tabs for depth map in WGSL, which is Texture Depth 2D. And Contrast Sampler also has a special tab, Sampler Comparison. So we have the depth map and also the coordinates of each fragment in the perspective view of light as well as the UV coordinates. So how do we use those values? We are going to use a WGSL built-in API, which is Texture Sample Compare. The first parameter is texture. The second one is the sampler com comparison. And the third one is the coordinates of X, Y. And the fourth one is the depth that we would like to compare, which is the Z value of shadow pulse. Because the sampler we said is uh, lice. So if the texture at x, y coordinates is less than the false value that we pass in, then the ACE API will return zero. Which means this point is not the first intersection of light. So we can ignore the parameters of diffuse and just times zero. In another case, if the z value of the texture is greater or equal to the pass in z value, then this API will return 1, which means it is closer to the light source and we should keep the parameters of diffuse. If you don't want to use the built-in texture sample compare API, you can also use the texture sample API we learned before.
And there are two things need to be noted here. We minus a small number to the shadow pose z value by 0.05. And why we do so? Let's get rid of it first to see what is different. Okay, we can see the alternating straps appear on the scene. And this is called a shadow distortion. And why does this happen? Because each incident lines and uh, fragment elements, they usually have a tilt angle. The distribution just like a slope. Secondly, one sampling due to the limitation of the resolution of texture. Multiple coordinates can be applied to the same texture pixel. Due to this reason, the fragment in this area might think it is on the slope or down the slope. And in the end, the light and dark strack will form. So how to resolve this problem? The easiest way is to apply a small offset. If we can increase the depth of the texture, it is equivalent to sinking the texture a little bit. But it's not convenient for us to increase the value in the texture, so we reduce the Z values before comparison. Let's try to reduce a small number here. And then we can see the distortion effect is removed. Because the offset is very small, so it will not affect the depth judgment of the scene. Actually, we can adjust the size of this offset according to the incident angle of the light. And another practical tip is the limitation of the texture resolution. We can notice that shadow has a judged edge. So how to improve the texture of shadows? And of course, we can increase the texture resolution or make the light range closer to the size of the scene. But this will not solve the problem of the sharp edges. The general solution is to apply a mean filter. The basic idea is to take depth around the pixel and then do the multiple sampling and then take the average. And then we can get a smoother edge effect. Here, we're going to use the simplest PCF filtering scheme. So we add the uh, rounding eight points with the depth itself and then uh, divide it by nine to get an average. And we use this value as the shadow parameter rather than just a zero and one. But it's a range between zero and one. And then we apply it to the diffuse effect then we can get a uh, very soft shadow effect. Let's look into the final effect. We can see the shadow's jacked effect is uh, reduced a lot. But of course, it requires more GPU performance consumption. All right, this is the complete shadow mapping process. To summarize, we render the scene once from the light perspective view to get the depth map of all objects. And then we render in the normal camera view by comparing the Z values in the fragment to determine whether this fragment is the first intersection of light. The principle is simple, but please practice and download the code. And next week, we are going to introduce more about WebGPU, and that is the last point of the basic tutorial. We are going to learn the compute shader and how to use GPU to do parallel computing. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.